Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University, and today I've got another interview for you. Uh, I've got Ellie here uh, to talk about uh, a DAP that he has built called Crypto Fighters. So you want to say hey to everybody, Ellie? Hey, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Ellie, I've got you know a, a few questions for you here about uh, the projects that you've been working on. But uh, before I jump into anything specific, do you want to kind of just give me uh, your elevator pitch about kind of your project? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, so Crypto Fighters, um, it, it was a team of six people behind it. Basically, we, yeah, we've been following the crypto space for a while, so all the exciting things happening in it. And I convinced basically a bunch of other friends to come on board on this project, produce something that we thought could be good and, yeah, become popular. And it's been decently popular so far, and we hope it continues to grow. Uh, crypto Fighters, in a nutshell, sort of similar to Crypto Kitties, where you could collect cats. Well, in Crypto Fighters, you collect fighters. Um, each fighter has its own genes. Um, his, he also has other things like uh, battle strength and vitality and other stats that help him in battles. Um, and yeah, these fighters, you can collect them, you can trade them, you can sell them, and you can also battle with them in the arena. So that's sort of the big thing we added. Um, I mean, beyond like sort of the whole gene mechanism and figuring all that stuff out. Um, crypto fighters, you can battle on the blockchain, win new fighters. Uh, these fighters you could sell on, you can level up your fighters. That's the basic concept. Very cool. Yeah, well, that, that's a pretty good explanation. Um, so if people wanted to find uh, your project, this is uh, cryptofighters.io, is that correct? Exactly, yeah. Okay, so yeah, CryptoFighter.io, if you go here, you can see there's a nice landing page. Um, gives you a pretty good explanation of what uh, crypto fighter is, or crypto fighters are, um, and kind of uh, gives you a good recap of, of what Ellie was just talking about, um, about how you can uh, collect these and also you know level them up and things like that. Um, so yeah, is there, are there any other links in particular that you'd like people to know about in, a, in addition to just the, uh, the website here? Um, I mean, we have a community on Discord, on Telegram. Those are sort of the two main places we're hanging out online. We have Reddit and other pages as well, but they're less active. Okay. Um, yeah, if you're getting started for the first time, take a look at the Getting Started page. Um, install MetaMask, deposit some money right. into your MetaMask wallet. Right. So yeah, if you're going to use this uh, game, you basically, you know, you'll need to use MetaMask with Chrome or something like Miss Browse or something like that. You'll need some Ether in your wallet in order to play. Um, yeah, very cool. So, yeah, there's also, we, we've got some partnerships with some like sort of the mobile browsers right now. One of them that just integrated us as well was Trust Wallet. So that's like, they're, they're quite a cool one, actually. They're both for Android and iOS. It's an open source wallet. Um, seems like a good guy, the, the guy behind the project. And yeah, it's basically you can play these games now on your phone as well with the wallet built into the app instead of MetaMask, for example. Nice, very cool. Yeah. So tell me about, uh, tell me about how you're using Ethereum in this project. Um, yeah, sure. So where do we start? So there are a few, I suppose there are three main contracts. Um, the, the sort of the core of the market I would say is heavily based on the CryptoKitties code. Um, they were sort of the the pioneers in this space, like the, the ERC721 tokens, mm -hmm. which are also non-fungible tokens. Basically what those are, uh, we have ERC20 tokens, which are like the popular coins everyone has, and every coin is the same as every other coin. And then we have uh, the EOS, like one EOS is worth the same as any other EOS token but with us crypto fighters every single fighter is its own entity so that's this erc721 standard that crypto kids has made very popular um the main contract of us basically tracks who is in con who the owners of every single fighter um like it might say I, ellie owns fighter 10 and fighter 15 gregory owns fighter 107 and so on and gives you the basic stats as well of all the fighters and their genes uh, there's a sales contract that is basically in charge of doing sales for people. Um, you can list your fighter on auction, you can buy fighters on auction. That all happens through the sales contract. The really cool thing about this as well um, is there are lots of sites you can buy and sell on. Like you're not forced to, let's say, buy through our sales contract. Right. It's all decentralized. There are, so, there are loads of other sites like 
Rarebits, OpenSea, um, Crypto Fighters is listed on both of them. So if you'd like, you could also go and buy on those sites as well. Um, so it doesn't have to use our sales contract, for example. And the, th the other big piece um, is the battle contract. So basically, um, yeah, if you want to go in battle, you can choose up to five fighters, put them you know, in our arena. Someone else can choose to battle against you again. And this sales contract, uh, sorry, this battle contract will then go and update the main contract with the results. And if you receive a prize fighter, this contract is in charge of updating that main contract. Also, in terms of updating the experience that each fighter has after a battle. So th that's all done through this contract. Nice. Very cool. So I've got a couple of questions in, in there uh, based on what you said. So I wanted to... Uh, Drill down just for a second on the you know ERC seven twenty one standard. Um, you know I've talked about that on my channel some, and and uh, also the ERC twenty standard. So, you know we talked about you talked about uh, you know a, a non fungible token, right? How these are assets that that work a lot like another cryptocurrency, um, but you know they're irre they're irreplaceable, right? You know one is not this; they're unique. One's not replaceable with another, right? So exactly. in the, in this case, you could essentially have like a fighter that becomes rare. You know, like is like if you had an EOS token, like you said, and one EOS token couldn't become rare. And exactly. you know the the importance of the ERC seven twenty one standard is it's a, it's a standard, right? You mentioned that that you can sell things um, outside of your sale contract. So um, you know, if there's an analogy here, your know, cryptocurrency can be sold on an exchange. And now there are these you know ERC seven twenty one marketplaces opening up that operate much like a, a crypto exchange, but for these types of assets. And that's sort of the importance of that standard is it gives us an interface that those uh, marketplaces uh, allow us to understand, right? Exactly. Right. Okay, cool. And now also, um, so now you, now, you know, you mentioned the three contracts, you've got the, the token contract, the token sale contract. Now, it sounds like the uh, the battle contract that you mentioned is is sort of what is sort of the secret sauce of your particular application. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot went into it, but it, like sort of the different parts of the DAP. But yeah, this sort of sort of yeah, this is where we took, let's say, crypto kitties forward in terms of the smart contract. Right, right, very cool. But yeah, and the big thing there, I would say, in terms of sort of. If you're building your own DAP, one of the things like to keep in mind is it's very hard to upgrade. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very hard to upgrade to, uh, smart contracts. Well, you can't really upgrade them. You can only replace them with a new one, which is fine. But if, for example, if you have like 2,000 fighters or maybe 500,000 crypto kitties um, and you want to replace and you find a bug in that core contract, right. like if you replace that contract with a new one, like suddenly it's going to have z zero data in it and to up, move that data in it could be very costly it might it, i don't know it seems like a real technical challenge so like what a lot of uh, like some advice to developers out there uh, try and separate out sort of different functionality into different contracts um storage let's say or the main storage you could stick in one contract which is basically what we did with our core contract and then other functionality like the battle contract that we can much easier upgrade we basically hook into it from the main contract. We we save in this in the core contract. This is the battle contract. Battle contract address is one two three, and then if we decide to upgrade the battle contract, so bat battles will now now take on a new form, and we just have to tell the core contract, okay, battle address has now changed to from one two three to four five six, right, and that is new address, right. So it sounds like uh, you know some of the long-standing software development principles of, uh, you know, almost, you know, especially in like object oriented systems where you want to, you know, simply replace one component and, you know, swap it out for another one. Those things are, are, uh, holding true and they, uh, just come with new costs associated with violating those principles <laughs> when you're developing on yeah, the Ethereum blockchain. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. And I suppose also thinking through it from the beginning, which isn't as important, let's say, in other development projects, you can always sort of change things up. But right. if your core contract doesn't allow you to do something, then like, and you want to add a feature half a year later, like you probably won't be able to add that feature without completely throwing everything on its head. Right. At least, at least in our project. But yeah. Right. Very cool. So you know, you uh, you mentioned that you assembled a team to work on this project. 
Um, so how you say how many did you say are on that team again? Uh, we have a total of six people. It was, it was five developers. Okay, and so on the on the technical side, um, what's sort of the what is the division of labor? What what is each person working on? Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, to be honest, like if you're starting your own project, I'm not sure you necessarily need five developers on a project like mm-hmm. this. Like I, I would say, even one developer could handle it all. But the main divisions of labor that we had, um, we, I mean, myself, I was basically the only one doing the Solidity code. Um, then on the front end, we were using Create React app basically as the right. basis. Um, and well, yeah, sort of working off those truffle boxes and Create React app, and we deployed that on Netlify for the front end. Um, so over there, yeah, we had two guys basically working on the front end, just splitting the tasks between them. Um, the I suppose the most challenging thing about the front end, like beyond any regular app, is just getting the Web3 stuff right. right I think along right. the way, we, we learned a bunch of stuff um, on the Web3 front. Um, and another, well, another part we had was we had one guy that was dealing with an API server. So you don't necessarily need this, depending on what your DAP looks like, but it's if you want quick access basically to the blockchain, um, querying the blockchain for thousands of fighters or doing certain operations might not necessarily be so easy, so right. depending on how the smart contract is set up, which, yeah, you, uh, you'd have to think about. But for example, if you're like, looking for 100 fighters in a group of 2,000 of them that all belong to a certain user, the smart contract may not be able to do that that quickly. You may even run out of like gas or so by the time that happens. So the API, um, and allow us sort of to, to cache things and to serve it faster to the users. So there we just, we had what, yeah, we, it was, someone stuck, up, like our partner stuck up a small Python server. We were listening to the blockchain every single time it updated. Then our MongoDB basically got updated as well with the same information. And then the API could serve that very quickly to the clients. Right. So this is, this is an API that you all hand rolled? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was like fairly minimal. Like yeah, it was quite minimalist. Um, but yeah, it was, the main task was really just updating the database and then just sending it off to the to the users. There wasn't any sort of authentication or anything like that needed. Just sending over data from yeah from Mongo. Nice. Um, yeah, and the last part of it as well, which was a bit of a challenge as well, just like putting it together. Um, I didn't deal with it too much, but all the images, each like sort of working out this entire gene system. Um, what certain genes represent, uh, but basically automating this whole process where you could create, let's say, four billion unique different fighters, or not, let's say, right. four billion, but millions of different unique characters with different backgrounds, if, and sort of generating those images as soon as the fighters created. So that was sort of another part of it, and that was also written in Python by one of my partners. Right. So the uh, so the um, actual rendering of the images. Um, Tell me about that. So did you have someone, you know, do the design work for each characteristic? And then how did you put it together? You know, what did what what uh, technology did you actually use to to make the images themselves? Right. So, um, yeah, we got a designer. Basically, we went through a bunch of people. We found one that we were happy with eventually. Um, he started walking, working on these characters. So far, we, we started off with four core characters and we re- recently re- released the fifth one as well who's quite rare, only one of him exists, but like more will be coming out. Um, And so basically each of these core characters, they have their own armor, their own, their own body shapes, what what are the different attributes they have? Yeah, they have different headgear, weapons, armor, um, different shoes. Those are some of the different background. Those are the main like sort of uh, like visual attributes that they have. yeah, the, I mean, my my partner handled most of it. Um, the process there was sort of just getting the designer to create the different parts. So he created the full image, but they're sort of in the AI file. There were different layers, so you could just show the art. You could easily replace like one piece of armor with another and generate sure. a whole new image. And yeah, the how that and then that was basically automated in Python. Um, the exact libraries that we used there, I'm not actually sure. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Uh, yeah yeah cool but yeah they did a good job there on that stuff yeah very cool um so does your uh 
does the website have the addresses to the smart contracts that people can see on Etherscan? Yeah, yeah, it does. If you look at the footer, um, you should see two contracts listed there. You could also probably quite easily find the sales contract from um, from looking at the main contract, basically. Sure. The battle contract actually links to, I think it's two other contracts, which don't have their source code revealed. And the reason for that is because we wanted to keep certain mechanics of the game hidden. So right. the two contracts it doesn't link to are the, like the gene science contract, which basically says... If I get gene A and gene B and I want to mix them together to create a new fighter, that bit, that contract basically handles that calculation. And a lot of our users have started to work out like exactly how that works, but the, the source code for that isn't public. Um, so battle contract just makes a call to gene contract and gets its result. And then for, um, yeah, and there's also another contract that handles the battle result and how much experience every fighter gets at the end of the battle. Um, so that contract as well, like deciding who wins the battle, we decided it would be more fun if that would be hidden and it wouldn't sort of be like obvious to everyone. Oh, I just need to do this and this right. to win my battle. Right. They could sort of just reverse engineer the strategy and, and win every time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the basic strategy there is a, so it depends on how strong your fighters are and there's an element of luck involved. So you'd never be able to guarantee a win because of that luck element. Right. But yeah, we just felt it was more fun if we kept the, the details of that hidden. Sure. Yeah, it's a good call. <laughs> yeah. So, um, tell me about uh, tell me about your your background before this, uh, before you got into you know developing this project on Ethereum. Had you built other Ethereum projects before, or um, you know what? B even before that, what was your background? Yeah. So um, yeah, I've, I've been developing for a few years now. Where do I start? Yeah, I, I got. I live in Israel. Um, I got a computer science degree out here. I originally from London, moved to Israel, did computer science here. Um, after that, I actually had to serve in the Israeli army for two and a half years. So I served there as a developer. There, the work was mostly C sharp. Um, and I, but on the side, I was also doing a lot of sort of full stack JavaScript, uh, running our own projects. What we've been running for the last two, well, maybe more, like the last four years or so, like either on the side or full time, is a project called Draw Fantasy. Um, it's a fantasy football game. It's quite popular in the UK. We have around 30,000 weekly active users. Um, and that's, yeah, for, uh, I don't know how much you're going to it. It's, it's a fantasy football game for those of you that know that it, or it is most people in America, I think, would know. Um, and it's for the Premier League. We brought an American draft style to the uh, to the UK market, basically. And that went well. And, we yeah, we were working on that for a while. And the, sort of in the background, we... We were getting into crypto quite a lot, like a lot of people in the office talking about it. And I had been reading about like sort of solidity and messing around with it a bit for the, I don't know, the half a year prior, basically, before Crypto Fighters. And then, you know, things sort of fell into place that we had more time to spend on other things apart from just Draft Fantasy. So I decided to do Crypto Fighters and got some other people involved that weren't part of Draft Fantasy. And yeah, we did it. But in terms of my background, it's mostly sort of, I'd say I'm strong at like full stack JavaScript and a bit of Elixir and Solidity. Those are sort of the three core things that I've been focusing on in the, in the last year. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, and I should, I should also mention just like, yeah, the guys. So I've since crypto fighters, we got into, yeah, uh, basically a lot of crypto jobs came up like development wise. So I started working for a company called CoTrader. They're doing an ICO in a few months from now. I just feel like I should mention them and sort sure. of like when the ICO comes out, if you want to get involved, um, what they are is a co-trading platform, which basically means, well, I won't go into it too much. I'm not sure what they want to reveal just yet, but you, you can basically, it's like sort of fund management on the blockchain where one person could invest lots of people's funds basically and get a success fee from that. Nice. So are you working on the, uh, uh, the ICO token sale for that project as well? Um, yeah, I suppose I will at some point. Um, so far, like, there's no public sale right now. They're just doing private sales. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, the public sale, I assume, like, a, a site like Open Zeppelin has a lot of these standard ERC20 tokens uh, done in a lot of different formats. So I'm not sure there's too much work to be done on that front, maybe a little bit if we need to customize how the sale works. But the real thing I've been working on for them so far, like as well as Crypto Fighters, are also doing CoTrader and there it's just sort of 
these smart funds where you could deposit money into a fund. Um, your it's like the the there's somebody that can manage the fund, but you can't just run away with the funds. And also, sort of calculating the profit, like but basically, he's able to take these funds, switch them into different ERC twenty tokens, um, be the fund manager for it. Anyone could sign up, be a fund manager, and yeah, try and make a profit. And you build up your reputation over time, and people see you're doing well, so they'd be interested in investing in your fund, basically. Nice. Well, maybe as that project goes along, uh, we can have you back on and talk about that one too. Um, yeah, sure. I would be happy to. I'd be happy to even say a bit more about it, but I'm like, I'm just sure. wondering. Yeah, like the sort of some of the stuff they want to keep a bit quiet now, and but other stuff they'd want to publicize uh, well, eventually. We'll give you some more time, and then you can just let me know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'd be happy to speak again. Cool. So, uh, how are you, how are you all monetizing crypto fighters? Yeah, so crypto fighters, the main, well, there's two ways that we have monetized. One is each time we generate a new fighter, uh, it's a new token, the, the sale of the fighter, it goes to us. So that's capped at 25,000 fighters. And each time we sell a generation zero fighter, the price could be anywhere from 0.1 Ethereum to 1 Ethereum. We've seen so far. Um yeah, so that, that revenue goes to us and allows us to further market the game, further to develop it um, in different ways. Um, the other way is also there's the sales contract right now takes um, around 3%. It takes 3.9% from every sale. Um, so if yeah, if I if I own a fighter and I sell him for one Ethereum, let's say 0. Uh, what is it? 0. 0.039 Ethereum, let's say, goes to the sales contract. So that's another way that we monetize Cool. Um, so yeah, you know, you mentioned uh, your background and then getting into Ethereum. You know, what I guess caused you to make the jump, and where do you see this technology going, and why did you invest in it? Right. Um, why? Well, wait. The first question: Why did why did I make the jump? I mean, it's I I think like. Yeah, crypto is cool. I mean, obviously, all the hype around like the market's going up and down every day, and in, in general, I've gone up quite a lot over the last year. Um, that all obviously caught our attention. Um, the idea of Ethereum and being able to like sort of write distributed apps on the blockchain, you know, it's it's there forever. No one can like everyone can see the code. No one can mess with it. Other people can integrate with it, like sort of how they want with other smart contracts. That whole idea was. It, yeah, it was very cool, and it's it. Yeah, we just like we saw a, like a fun opportunity. We, we were doing games already, and now sort of to do another game on the blockchain uh, that we also saw good uh, like sort of revenue potential for. Um, that is like sort of why we took the plunge and went ahead with it. And yeah, I'm, I've been enjoying this space a lot, and so sort of, it's moving very quickly as well. And there's still the development wise, I would still say there's a lot that still has to happen. It's not the smoothest sort of getting going with Solidity and the different things like Truffle and even MetaMask, like so many, there's still a whole bunch of bugs around and every, every few weeks a few get updated, but yeah, it, it's definitely a developing space and a lot still has to happen. Right. So where, uh, maybe what, what do you hope to see, you know, happen soon and, and maybe where do you, where do you see things going maybe in the long term? Um, oh. Where, uh, well, I know that's two questions. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. So. So. Yeah. In terms of development the stuff, like sort of, what I'm personally quite interested in. Obviously, making things easier to use. Um, projects like Truffle, for example, which are really great. I think you've mentioned them in past videos, right? I have, huh? Yeah. Okay. So there, um, the more you get into it, like sort of things randomly crash. Um, because there are bugs, to be honest. Let's say you try to do truffle debug, there's sort of a, a debug mode where you can step through the code, but that's sort of very early stages. I think in the latest release of truffle 4.1, they sort of tried to fix some of those issues, but I think there are still some others. Um, not sure, there's a whole long list of sort of, I maybe like small technical details that I'd like to see improved over time. In terms of a sort of core Ethereum development, um, debugging can be very difficult. Um, Writing tests is super, super important, I would say. Like, we have tests for everything for co trader and for crypto fighters. So, that I would definitely recommend getting into. That, like, also something you mentioned in previous videos. 
But if people want good examples for it online, if they take a look at the um, CryptoKitties repository, I think it's called CryptoKitties Bounty, take a look through all the tests that they wrote, and that should like that should be like a good starting point to write your own tests. Um, that will make like your life way, way easier. Um, it's still annoying though that like when a contract throws an error, um, you can't uh, you can't easily see what the error is. Right. So like it will just it will throw an exception. It's like what is it? Like and if a method is complicated, it's like it could have happened for a hundred different reasons. Um, and you can't even sort of use events there to log things along the way. The, the events won't get logged out when you when the errors are being thrown. So something like that, I don't know how Ethereum is going to deal with it, but like development wise, that would be like a very nice thing if we could sort of better throw errors in Solidity, maybe throw some extra information that, that I think that would help developers a lot. Um, but yeah, into, like, I don't know, it'll be interesting to see what happens to Ethereum as a whole with proof of stake. And um, th th yeah, there's been some interesting updates in the, in the latest releases. In Byzantium, they released uh, ZK Snark technology. Mm -hmm. um, Zcash had, um, yeah, basically the sort of an, an, like anonymous technology that Zcash uses is now available in um, in Ethereum in the in the latest version that is on the mainnet. So we, I haven't seen too much work done with it yet. But one of the things CoTrader would like to do is also hook into that technology and make certain function certain functions in the platform anonymous. So that I'd like to sort of see that space develop as well. There are projects like Socrates and anyway, there's a lot there, but that, that still has to develop as well. Right. And that's a, that's a very interesting, uh, yeah, new development. So may, maybe just clarify for people what ZSARX is for a second, just so uh, that if they yeah, don't know about yeah. anonymous transactions and things like that, maybe may explain like what, it, you know, what, what it is without it. And then when we have it, the difference that that makes. Yeah, I mean, the basic idea is um, right now the blockchain is incredibly public. Mm -hmm. um, Ethereum, every transaction you do, um, if you buy a crypto fighter, I can see it. Everyone can see it in the entire world. They might not know you're behind the address, but that address, it's entire history ever. Every piece of money it's ever sent and received is all public. Every game it's ever played. So, um, yeah, basically there are other coins like Monero and ZK, Zcash where things are anonymous. You can make a transfer to someone, but they can't see how big your Ethereum balance is right now or how big your XMR or whatever balance is. Um, Z, there are different ways that that is handled. Um, with Zcash, they use something called ZK Snark to do it. Um, ZK stands for zero knowledge. So sort of the idea of zero knowledge proofs how you can prove you know something without having actually revealed the the information. Um, sort of, it, uh, I think a simple example in the crypto world is signing something with a private key. So you can prove you're the owner of a public address without actually revealing that you own, the, the, without revealing the private key. But we know that oh, you, you've proved to us that you own this private key without actually handing it over, without actually us taking control of it. So that's the, the basic idea of zero knowledge proofs, that you can do cool stuff like that. And then ZK Snarks, basically imagine that, like taking that a step further, but uh, the class, uh, one classic example is imagine a game of Sudo Sudoku where you want to prove to your friend that you've solved this problem, but uh, you don't want to reveal the answer to them. So that seems like a really tough problem. Like how on earth do you do that? There's, an, sort of, there's a Sudoku board with like 10 numbers revealed and you want to prove that you filled in the other 100 numbers. So how would you do that? So basically ZK Snarks allow you to do things like that. They allow you to... Prove, like prove that you've computed certain things. Um, there's a there's a few cool examples. I can't think of others, but yeah, Sudoku is one of them. And basically, Zcash uses this to, to like to prove basically that you've done certain computations, that certain trans certain fund transfers have been done um, without sort of revealing the the information. Without like basically, you can prove that you have a hundred Zcash money to send over to someone else. And like you'd be able to send it, but they can't actually see your full balance and what you have there. That's how it's used in Zcash. Right. And yeah, so how it could, it could have like a similar use in Ethereum to, to hide certain things. But I haven't seen any sort of real live production examples yet. Uh, I would be very excited to see something like that. Um, somebody using Byzantium well with Ethereum and to see exactly how that works and sort of what Etherscan shows and doesn't show like 
how the, the hidden mechanism works exactly. Right. That's a great explanation. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I, I, I'll be honest, like it's not something like I, I started reading up about it quite a lot recently, but it's not something I like I know in depth sort of all the mathematical proofs of the ZK snark stuff. Um, I'd say I'm like sort of beginner, like just having just read the basics of it, but not like not know all the technical details just yet. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's see here. Um, is So... Are there any um, other places on social media that you want people to know about for uh, the project? Um, yeah, I mean, follow us on Twitter as well. I didn't mention that one before. Twitter, Crypto Fighters, Facebook as well, um, Reddit, and uh, the other two I mentioned, um, the Telegram group and the Discord channel. If you want to talk to us one-on-one, -on -one, we're always happy to speak with people. Sure. Awesome. Cool. Um, okay, so is there anything else that you'd like pe for people to know about the project? Anything that I may not have uh, gotten into in the interview? Um, what do we want to say? Um, any, any exciting news in, that you can talk about for the future? For Crypto Fighters, um, what, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we continue to sort of build up marketing partnerships and to, to, to grow the game a lot. Um, and yeah, so we'd like to see it grow a lot more still. Um, in terms of future developments, I mean, we're continuously improving things for players. Like we sort of see where the pain points are. Um, sometimes it's sort of difficult getting feedback. Like you've done something on the blockchain and you don't know has your transaction gone through or not. You've got to check Etherscan. And so yeah, there are certain things we're like sort of user experience wise that we're improving for people. And we might do a, a small update to the battle contract soon as well. But uh, yeah, that's about it for crypto fighters. Cool. Nothing sort of next level that I can think of that is on the agenda just yet. So it's sort of just optimizing and improving what we have. Sure, sure. Well, I think uh, I, along with everybody else, look forward to uh, seeing crypto fighters grow and more people come on board and are excited for anything that you all might do to uh, kind of improve the, the product over time. Um, well, cool. Well, I, uh, I've enjoyed our chat today. Uh, thanks so much for kind of giving us the, the rundown and, and giving us some very, uh, s some pretty cool explanations about, uh, some Ethereum concepts on top of just, uh, how your, how your DAP works. Uh, I know people are excited to, to get to hear that. Um, Ellie, so thanks a bunch, man. I really enjoyed our chat. Um, everybody, if you'd like to see more interviews like this one with uh, Ellie here about you know some real life decentralized applications on the Ethereum blockchain, just make sure you subscribe to the channel, and uh, you'll get notified about those. And until then, thanks for watching DAP University. See ya.